This is a reading uh, from Virginia, the Old Dominion, by Matthew K. Jandrew. And it's in the chapter entitled "The Flanders of America." begins on page begins on page 491 and ends on page 495. I would encourage you to see the previous video, the preface to this. If you have not, if you've not done so, it may be in your best interest to go back to that video and then come back to this. Okay. As the McClellan campaign was drawing to a close, a vote in the northwestern counties, then under federal domination, was being cast preliminary to the procedure that led to the division of Virginia. This movement may be traced to its beginning when, upon the passage of the Ordinance of Secession, the remainder of a group of unconditional unionists from the western section met in Richmond to discuss plans for intrastate secession. The discussion seems to have been known to Governor Letcher, who permitted these delegates to depart in contrast with the policy of the federal government, which, judged by the steps taken to hold Maryland in line for the Union, would have ordered their arrest and imprisonment. In fact, it appears from contemporary accounts, John S. Carlyle, one of the Unionists, went straight from Richmond to Washington and revealed there the proceedings of the Virginia Convention, although the members had been pledged to secrecy. In Western Virginia, on April 22nd, a meeting of Unionists was held in Clarksburg, the home of Carlisle, where it was arranged to call a convention at Wheeling in the Western Panhandle between Ohio and Pennsylvania and well within the federal line. The vote for the convention on May 13th was confined almost entirely to a few towns, and 26 of the counties of the Western section were not represented. 429 delegates attended, the majority of whom refused to support separation plans but a resolution was approved calling for delegates to be elected for another convention to meet on June 11th, which it seems the promoters hoped would be selected with a view to setting up a new commonwealth. This, this second convention issued a declaration of the people of Virginia, adopted an ordinance providing for the reorganization of the state, and authorized summoning what was termed the General Assembly of Virginia to convene in Wheeling on July 1st. Francis H. Pierpont was elected governor of Virginia, and he and all other officers were required to take an oath of allegiance to the federal government, after which the convention adjourned to meet August 5th. This general assembly, composed of 30-odd members of some of the western counties, convened the 1st of July. John S. Carlisle and Waitman T. Willie were promptly nominated and elected to the United States Senate both presenting themselves to the Congress of the United States as Senators from Virginia. On the convening of the extra session on July 4th, President Lincoln advocated recognition of Carlisle and Willie as representatives of the state of Virginia, constitutional questions being set aside on the ground of military and political expediency. The Wheeling Convention was now prepared to set up the proposed new state. At first, the Committee on Division sought to include the northern tier of counties in the east as well as those in the west, but a change of plan was effected under which 39 counties in the western section of the state were to constitute the state tentatively named Kanawha, while seven additional counties were to decide later by local option as to their choice of allegiance. It is somewhat difficult to follow the kaleidoscopic changes in the roles played by pretty much the same group of men who called and organized the first, or May Convention, arranged for the second convention in June, and a general assembly in July. With the two bodies concurrently constituted, they met one day as members of the convention to set up a new state, and on the next as members of the assembly to give thanks to their own accomplishments as members of the convention. They also arranged for controlled voting at the polls to be sure that their acts would be duly ratified. In addition, the people of the new state were, on October 24th, to vote for delegates to still another convention to draw up a constitution in which sponsoring members of the previous conventions and the General Assembly were, as usual, included. The majority of the members of the body did not oppose the perpetuation of slavery, but all Negroes were forbidden to enter the new state, whether slave or free. By way of explanation of this attitude towards the Negroes as a race, it should be said that the exclusion of the free Negro was in keeping with the sentiment in the northwestern states, several of which had passed laws to prevent Negro immigration of any sort. Abraham Lincoln had voted for such exclusion when he was a member of the legislature of Illinois. Carlisle, an unconditional unionist, had, in arguing against secession in March 1861, declared, I have been a slaveholder from the time I've been able to buy a slave. 
I have been a slaveholder not by inheritance, but by purchase, and I believe that slavery is a social, political, and religious blessing. How long, if you were to dissolve this union, if you were to separate the slaveholding from non-slaveholding states, would African slavery have a foothold in this portion of the land? I venture the assertion that it would not exist in Virginia five years after the separation, and nowhere in the southern states twenty years after. How could it maintain itself, with the whole civilized world, backed by what they call their international law, arrayed for its ultimate extinction with this north, which is now bound to stand by us and to protect slavery, opposed to us? Carlyle was referring to the passage of the 1861 Amendment to the Federal Constitution guaranteeing the perpetuation of slavery. He evidently assumed that the northern states would ratify the amendment, as did Ohio and Maryland. The Constitution of West Virginia was submitted to the people in April 1862, but several of the counties included were silent, and the majority of the affirmative votes were cast in the four counties lying between Ohio and Pennsylvania. The arbitrary procedure pursued in the dismemberment of Virginia was being carried on in the name of constitutional government, but it was not yet complete. The new state junto, after calling itself the Restored Government of Virginia, in order to maintain a pretense of obeying Article 4, Section 3 of the United States Constitution, that a state must approve its own division, now gave formal sanction for the creation of a new commonwealth. This was done soon after the Restored Legislature convened on May 5, 1862. On May 29, Senator Willie presented to Congress the petition of dismemberment as proceeding from the free choice of the people of Virginia. After a delay of several months, the bill was passed, December 10, 1862, by a party majority. With his cabinet divided on the question, President Lincoln signed the bill with the explanation that since it was a war measure, the irregularity of the proceeding would not be likely to establish a dangerous precedent. The Presidential Proclamation of Emancipation, likewise a war measure, had already been announced. This was applicable only to those states or parts of states in rebellion after January 1, 1863. Hence, West Virginia, as a loyal state, was permitted to continue slavery, but gradual emancipation was required. Consequently, the state convention was reconvened and the Constitution amended to meet this requirement. This was done in February 1863, in March it was ratified, and in April, President Lincoln proclaimed West Virginia duly qualified for admission into the Union, effective June 20, 1863. Since the new state had now been reorganized by act of Congress, Governor Pierpont felt constrained to remove the restored government to some spot in Old Virginia, and Alexandria was chosen. Part of the time, he could lay claim to several nearby counties. In short, such portions of Virginia as happened to be under federal control, although an exception may be noted for Norfolk and its vicinity, where a rival appeared in the person of General B. F. Butler of Massachusetts, who held an election in that neighborhood and was returned victor by 330 votes to 16 for Pierpont. After the restored government had established headquarters in Alexandria, somewhat the same irregular procedure was followed as in the formation of West Virginia. An election was held in 1863, but even a partisan majority in Congress refused to recognize the representatives chosen because of the handful of votes cast. Nevertheless, the restored legislature of some 13 members in both houses issued a call for a constitutional convention whose 15 delegates subsequently met in Alexandria, February 13, 1864, where a new constitution for the state of Virginia was drawn up. This was subsequently approved by some 500 persons voting upon the matter. The sequel to these proceedings is set forth in a subsequent chapter but it is necessary to refer to the plan of some persons of influence to take two more counties away from Virginia and annex them to West Virginia. These two counties were Jefferson and Berkeley, which, together with Morgan, now constituted the so-called Eastern Panhandle of the new state. Consequently, elections were ordered in those counties, and, with a limited suffrage, it was declared that a majority of the voters were in favor of annexation to West Virginia. Berkeley was, therefore, proclaimed a part of that state in August 1863 and Jefferson in the following November. Okay. Thank you for your time.